Hello and welcome to another Cork and Taylor Wine Podcast. Luke Taylor here. And first off, I want to thank Silvador Brands as an extremely effective and affordable wine preserver. We are excited to partner with Silvador Brands as the official wine preserver of the Cork and Taylor Podcast. Open whatever you want, whenever you want. 100% Aragon Silverado Wine Preserver allows you to do just that. Go to silvadorbrands.com and click the For Your Home to Order. When checking out, enter Cork and Taylor in the discount code and receive 10% off your next order. Uh, the links for that uh, website will be below. Also, follow, subscribe, like us on Instagram, Facebook, and also on the uh, any of your favorite pod, podcast providers, including, uh, let's see, what do we got? Um, what's that one called? Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and also YouTube. So, um, so we're exci- I'm excited. This is where it kind of began for me in Napa. We're at Rutherford Hill. We're in the caves. We're with Michael, who is the winemaker, uh, was also adored and loved by every cougar and older lady who loves Chardonnay because of your experience at Rombauer. Right. We're going to talk about that. But uh, Michael Cody from uh, Winemaker of Rutherford Hill Winery, thanks for having me on the Cork and Taylor Wine Podcast. Yeah, what a great opportunity. And thank you for your time. And thank you for making the treacherous journey out from out east. Yeah, it's, it's not that treacherous, dude. Yeah. Well, it's not that treacherous. <laughs> believe me, it's only a direct flight. And it, it did, the problem is you, leave at, you have to leave your house at like 4.30. And your flight's at seven, and then I'm all perky and stuff like that. But it's it's worth it. I mean, I'm, I'm in God's country, right? I'm in well, wine country. Coming to ca- uh, California where there's no snow and ice to deal with at four thirty in the morning, it's pretty sweet. Yeah, it is. It is. Everybody's like, "Why are you up so early?" So I, I go to bed at like eight thirty your time. So when I go home, I'm on my normal schedule. So I have no jet lag. See, that's a, that's a good trick that you didn't know. So you've worked um, Rombauer, Ian J. Gallo, uh, Wolf Blass, I believe, Chateau um, Margot. In his Killian, I mean, you've, you've, it, I believe it's 16 harvests in four different countries. Yeah. Yeah. I've, um, that's crazy. Essentially try to build my resume, uh, learning from some of the best and most iconic wineries in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't get to be good without learning from the best and yep. they've all got their secrets and what better way than getting right in their grill and learning, um, getting your hands dirty. Yeah. Your generation, that, that generation of winemakers, it seems like you do a lot of traveling, uh, learning, whereas more maybe someone that's maybe a little bit more established uh, might have worked with the family winery or one other winery in Napa before they've come to Rutherford Hill or their families or their friend, whatever winery. So I think it's really um, interesting. I guess what do you, what have you taken from the four different countries? How and, and I guess also too another part of the question is how different is winemaking in each country compared to let's say what you're doing here at Rutherford Hill. Yeah, so I think Rutherford Hill is just a nice um, culmination of all the things that I've learned from around the world. Um, okay. Obviously, starting in Australia, I uh, was fortunate to work with some of the oldest wineries there, um, see an old winery that has stood the test of time and what made them successful, which was Tabilk. Mm-hmm. Um, they were the largest su- um, producer of Marsan in the Southern Hemisphere. Wow. And just seeing uh, a winery that has a pretty much... Um, unrecognized on a mass consumer level variety Marsan and producing a lot of it and getting some world acclaim for it in like the cult, um, you know, echelons of sommeliers and uh, master psalms and uh, obviously master wine that really recognize uh, the variety and what it has to offer. So that was cool. Um, And then working with a really old winery there. So going from there and then branching or spreading the wings and going to Inniskillen in Canada and learning about ice wine, Um, obviously in your backyard in Niagara on the Lake. Um, Working with a great winemaker there, Bruce Nicholson. Okay. He was uh, out in Okanagan at the time before he joined when I joined um, for Harvest and just learning that I was really blessed there because... I had an Okanagan winemaker that's used to different varieties and different things, and he was bringing some new thoughts and schools of thought to Inniskillen out, out east. Um, and yeah, that was awesome. And to just con- cont- continuously ask why, I think, is probably the most important thing. I'm you're learning. one of those people. You're like yeah. my, my kid, my seven and nine, my nine-year-old, especially Sammy, my mini-me. Why, 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 why? Right. I'm like, just shut up, kid. Just the, do what I tell you. But the thing <laughs> yeah. is, I mean, from a winemaker's perspective, like to them, it's inherent and you learn at school and they tell you the world mm-hmm. chemistry and they teach you the book, but you can't learn from 
without experience in my mind. So mm -hmm. when you've got somebody like that, they're going to see something different. And for me, uh, the most important thing is the different way of thinking. So the Canadians, in my mind, ha have to deal with sour rot, something Australia doesn't have. And the mm -hmm. whole reason is because Australia doesn't really have a fruit fly problem. So mm -hmm. to just come and see what he was doing out there, obviously cool climate, um, dealing with green characteristics and... You know, the labor is different there. So just seeing that alone and then jumping over to France and then Bordeaux, where you're in the, you know, you're in the stratosphere of in terms of wine meccas and yeah. working with Margot and just seeing the, how dedicated they are to the homage of, of just Margot, let alone Bordeaux and the, how precise they are on everything and how they think about things and uh, the attention to detail is incredible. But, but you know what's amazing to me with, with Bordeaux? They make like three wines or they might make one wine. Whereas you come to, let's say, Rutherford Hill or some other American wineries, and I'm not too familiar with how Australian perceive different lines, extensions, and what have you. But it's amazing to me, Bordeaux does like a, a rouge and a, and a blanc, and, and that's it, a red and a white. Right. And they might do like, we've had Chateau uh, Smith uh, Feet La Hot, uh, Smith Feet Hot, Smith, Smith La Feet last week? No, Smith Hot La Feet, yeah, God, Fabian. And they only make six wines, and it's three different lines, uh, you know, upper, middle, and, and lower, and it's red and white, and that's it, and that's it. And I mean, that's common of a lot of uh, pretty much all Bordeaux producers, not common for Napa or Californian wines by any stretch of the imagination. Right, yeah. Um, I like to blame the marketers, but I've got a master yep. wine business, so I get, we're here for business, right? Mm -hmm. And the world, the new world wineries um, are here to make money, and they haven't got the reputation that Margot does, where, I mean, they're established, and everybody from around the world recognizes them, knows they make great wine, and sadly here is, um, you know, we, we're still trying to figure out what's great, but also we've got consumers that come, you know, there you don't have a tasting room. Here you have a tasting room. Here you've got a business front. You've got to appease. Otherwise, yeah, you become obsolete, right? Because there's so many wineries that offer so many great things. Mm -hmm. How did you experience the cold in Canada? Loved it. Wow. Yeah. Um, coming from Australia <laughs> where... Uh, you hardly ever saw snow. You had to drive to the snow to find the yeah, snow. You really uh, got to find it though, right? Yeah. And just to prove my ignorance that I'd never dealt with freezing, so I couldn't figure out why, uh, how the the fluid on the windscreen wipers didn't f freeze because we always just put water and soap in, right? Because yeah. it washes your windscreen. Yeah. And so to combat that, it's like, whoa, that was mind-blowing alone. And then, yeah. Wait, time out. You put water and soap in your windshield? Yeah, in a hot climate. It doesn't freeze, so why would it? It never, f it doesn't work. So... Mm. You yeah, see, it's different. And when I learned that, I'm like, why wouldn't you do that? And then I learned. So it cleans the it cleans your windshield wipers. Yeah, your windscreen. Yeah. Your windscreen. Yeah, you put dishwasher. Yeah, I've never thought about well, that. It never freezes, right? So yeah, I'll have to try that. Not not right yeah. now. Like maybe in the summer. Yeah. Well. So what happens if you're driving and you think it's uh, windshield wiper fluid and you forget to take out the water and the soap? Well. It, it just washes it for you, so you just yeah. use it all the time. I mean, you're not putting in... It's not like foaming out the wazoo, you know. It's yeah, just I would think it would be. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I learned something. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you always learn something. So, but, uh, so you are the first University of Adelaide and Charles Stewart uh, University grad on the Cork and Taylor podcast, and I'm quite excited about that. Um, so you went from Margot, Innes Killian, Wolf Blass. Uh, what, was e what was Ian J. Gallo and Rombauer like? Um, Ian J. Gallo... I would highly recommend every winemaker, as much as it is taboo in the industry and everybody, oh, they just make yeah. bulk wine. That is legitimately a school and a different way of thinking. And mm -hmm. I was incredibly fortunate to work in the new product team. I managed the team. And what I got to see and what I got to learn was just mind-blowing. You know, obviously, you, you know, I worked at AWRI as a winemaker there, and I got to see the world of, of the latest innovations and what certain companies were working on to like do some cutting edge stuff and you know at the time it was lower alcohol and now low alcohol is taking off and so to work with those used people 10 years ago now is pretty crazy to me um and to at least see some of their products come through which is awesome but then ian j gallo you see what private money does rather than government money and just to see how diverse they are um they obviously invest in a lot in r d and mm. you can see why they're such a great winery and yep. They think about things in such a different way, and I think that's invaluable. You know, yeah. you learn about how to deal with so many things on a large winery that you wouldn't deal in a small winery, and just having that opportunity. If you go in with an open mind, the world's your oyster. Mm -hmm. um, their attention to consumers and learning all the insights and why they do what they do, amazing. And then to have resources like aroma chemists that are so specialized <laughs> and have been with them for 30 years that are just in wine, 
I mean, they have stuff that you couldn't even dream of, and some of the stuff they're working on, um, amazing. But as a, but as being as big and, and kind of as as uh, well regarded because they've done it for so long, as a winemaker, do you have the freedom to kind of do some certain things to kind of play with the spice rack, or is it pretty much you've got to follow? a certain thing which the aroma specialist might say or this person might say and because it's more maybe analytics than maybe feel per se? Well, um, in my world, we were always cutting edge. So we had to push the envelope. We, we had to turn the Titanic. Um, we had to break the, the lanes that everybody was running on. We had to take them out of the comfort zone. So my world was a little bit different. A lot of the winemakers, we'd have to say, right, you guys need to try and figure out how to take our cute little 20,000 gallon tank and you now need to make it 200,000 and keep it the same. Mm -hmm. So there were challenges there and you wanted to make them successful. It was really great is the team collaboration at Gallo and the, I call it the school of Gallo because they, they did invest a lot in you and that's very unique in my mind in the wine industry. Um, just to help you grow in your relationship. So it was really one team, one dream there, and it was mm -hmm. a really good opportunity. Mm -hmm. So awesome. to answer your question, um, there are times when you have to stay in your lane, but there's other times where you get to explore, like you'll get certain oak providers come in, but then also you've got a process tech team that has oak uh, alternatives they're working on, because why buy it? They buy so much, so mm -hmm. it pays them to have some people looking at some things. Right, so, isn't that crazy? And, but just to geek out on... Like you've got people there that are so passionate about yeast and like, all right, we're going to do this. And like, yeah. well, mind blowing. Yeah. I can only talk about yeast so much. The only thing I like about yeast is it rises my uh, pizza dough. Um, and then how was, uh, what was Rombauer like? Rombauer is um, a unique side of the world, right? Yeah. As you say, um, <laughs> you know, you, you um, had a lot of people chasing you for, for the, the wine. The older ladies. Yeah. yeah. The cougar crack. Yeah, it was pretty good. I went to, down <laughs> it was to. was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was because there were so many interesting people and yeah. it was amazing like uh, at E&J Gallo, one of the ones uh, that we were, uh, obviously they monitored all the brands. One of the ones we looked at was Rombauer and, um, you know, we looked at the wines and like interesting and, uh, but to actually meet the customer and actually see stuff rather than just seeing numbers on a spreadsheet, right. it was amazing to talk to uh, uh, I think that wine brings a lot of people together, regardless of demographic or yeah. affordability. It's just yep. a great gateway drug. Yeah. Gateway drug. I like it. I like it. So let's do this. Let's try a little wine while we talk. So you've got tank stamp samples, and I take it these are all your creation, hence why we're tasting them, because right. you came, what, uh, 2001 or 2000? No, last year, right? Yeah. Last yeah. Summer, eight yeah. months ago. Yeah, so months ago. what we have here, we have two tank samples, the Sauvignon Blanc and the Rosé. Okay. Um, and then I inherited the 21s, but we put some finishing touches on, streamlined some oaks, and um, we're trying to work on a new direction for the brand. Okay. So some exciting things here. Um, the white you've got is a little cloudy still. We're not quite finished that. It'll be in June. Um, we're trying to take the Sauvignon Blanc to a really uh, nice premium level and rival some of the greatest, um, particularly up and down the street here in um, Rutherford and um, down towards Stag's Leap. Right. So really shooting for that really nice aromatics, but also the main thing for me when you're going for the upper level is just having that evolving palette. So you've got that really nice mid palette, but you've got that really nice essentially layers of spice coming in mm -hmm. as you talk about the spice rack and for a complex wine that continually evolves i think uh there's some really exciting things here yeah absolutely so rutherford hill i believe last year was their 50 year anniversary um maybe even longer no i think it was 50 years yep yeah 50 in 22 years. yeah yep. and they're rebranding kind of changing some things up so what are some of the different stuff they're doing uh what are they changing what they did before to to what they're trying to do now yeah, so uh, Rutherford Hill was uh, in the industry being known as quite the Merlot house um, and has been that way yes. for a long time. Yeah, good Merlot. Yeah, so um, one of the things we're doing is uh, revitalizing the packaging. We're doing a lot of premiumization. Uh, you walk past the optical sorter, so we're bringing a lot more focus onto um, fruit purity. Um, we've obviously got um, the estate vineyard up here, and so now we're just putting a whole focus onto all the great things we have. And our AJT vineyard, excuse me, which is down on Me Lane. Okay. Um, it's a 55-acre parcel out there. We're focusing on some really nice Sauvignon Blanc because Rutherford does a really great job with Sauvignon Blanc. It does. Yeah. But then uh, we're diving into the beautiful Rutherford dust and the, the Cabernet that we can offer down there. Mm -hmm. um, so we're starting to see the snippet of that vineyard coming online. It's been, this is uh, coming on the end of the sixth year, so it's really starting to get into its own, which is exciting. So we've just got more and more momentum getting behind the brand and premiumization nice. and focusing on quality and, and 
uh, our sense of place. Yeah. How, how many cases produced do, uh, does Rutherford Hill do? Uh, so across the board, we'd, we're doing about ten to 11,000 of the Cabernet and then about 13,000 of the Merlot. Okay. And then we're doing about 4,000 of the Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. And then we've got a, uh, about a dozen um, wine club wines that are about 400 cases each. Okay. So, so about thirty to 35,000. So kind yeah. of a nice, uh, a nice range and also obviously a nice um, production size. Yeah. And we get to explore the valley up and down on some great pots of Merlot. And yeah, so there are lots mm-hmm. of exciting things to do here. Yeah. So wh- I guess why you? Why did they pick you? And that's not that mean to be disrespectful, but why you? Yeah. I don't know. That's a great question. I wasn't the hiring manager. Uh, <laughs> you didn't ask him though? Um, no, not really. Um, I, I, it sounds a little... Um, one-sided, but for my mind, uh, as an employer, it's nice that they pick me, but I've got mm-hmm. to pick them too. Right. And I think what really brought me in and why I bothered to try, I think the the family heritage is fantastic here. The Tolatas have owned it since 96. Their commitment and what they've done at Sanford is really exciting, and they want to take this to the next level too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for me, there's a really nice package of what the family's got to offer and their uh, testament here. And if you uh, read about Anthony, he did a great job uh, and he had a really great vision for the property. Sadly, he's no longer with us, but it's really exciting that Bill and John have the vision to take this uh, and make this their dad's legacy. And yeah, awesome. to be part of that's really great. Obviously, it's one of the um, founding wineries of the Napa Valley. You know, 50 years is not that common out here. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it's to be part of an opportunity to a rebrand take a new direction and then um to have the support of the family to to drive this is really exciting awesome how much i guess how much because you're in a kind of a nice size brand or a, a family company and a brand how much um how much ownership do you get for each wine like like do you, do you i mean do you pretty much just craft the best wine you can and whether is there any stylistic uh, limitations or anything that they say like we want you to do this or is it kind of like hey, I can do whatever I want. It's carte blanche. Yeah, it was pretty much carte blanche here. They said, look, we acknowledge we need to take it in a new direction. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you've got a lot of business experience. You've seen a lot of the world. You've seen a lot of styles. Um, We need you to help us get there. Mm -hmm. And we're here to take the barriers down to help you make uh, great wine. And um, yeah, other than that, they have been very, very supportive and just like make great wine and let's get on with it. (laughs) Rosé. Yeah. That's lovely. Rosé of what? Merlot. Oh, shocker. Yeah. But the funny thing is, um, for me, out of all the research I did on rosé, which unfortunately at Gallo was a lot of research, Mm -hmm. but in hindsight, I was really fortunate because I think Merlot ironically makes some of the best rosé and we did it. We didn't do Sarnier, which to me is a little cheating. We did a whole, or we did Provence style and we dove right in and we did a whole cluster and we got it all right. Um, to me, it's actually really exciting. And the reason why I think Merlot does a really good job at rosé is one of the key things in my mind for rosé is the mid palate. And we have the perfect uh, climate for making great rosé. It obviously doesn't command the 90 to to $100 for, for a wine. Um, but I think what you get here is a really good expression. You can make it really elegant, um, but still deliver that really nice juicy mid palate. And I'm pretty excited with this one. We did five... Um, barrels of um, uh, of fermentation, whereas the rest was in stainless steel. So we got that really nice creamy mid palate and we got that lick of um, nice little, little bit of glycerol on the finish. But it, it, as this continues to open up, you get that little bit of hints of spice, even though the barrels are six months, uh, six years old. Um, I'm really excited with this wine. I think it's yeah. going nice to, I'm hoping pleasant. it's going to be a nice uh, segue into what we've got to come. Yeah. Do Australians like rosé? Uh, they do. They love Grenache rosé, particularly out of McLaren Vale. Um, mm-hmm. Grenache is kind of like Pinot, so um, it tends to be a little light, but uh, Australians like to make it quite deep and dark. So what yeah. they do is they saigne it, and they make some really great rosé out of that. What, ver- what, I guess, what wine do you really like? What is your favorite wine to make for Rutherford Hill? Um, that's a really great question. I, uh, it only I- took 20 minutes to get that comment. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the only reason I say that it's a great question is because they're all your babies and yeah. um, I, I, I thoroughly enjoy the challenge of trying to make different expressions of wine and try to take customers on the journey of where we want to take this wine. So the Sauvignon Blanc, I 
love the Sauvignon Blanc um, in terms of getting some mid palate and the challenge of doing that in Sauvignon Blanc while respecting a lot of the fruit is very difficult. And then maintaining the mid palate on the rosé is really great as well. Um, but then when you get to the Merlot and the Cab to try and make different styles of wine, uh, I love that too. For me, it's the challenge and then to see the beauty in each one and work through the barrels and try and amplify any of the characteristics that um, just show the beauty of the, the place that we got it. Uh, so for me, um, it's just like any kid, you never have your preferences or you're not supposed to air them. Yeah. I just tried the 2020 Merlot. 21? 21, yeah, 2021. Yeah, sorry, 20, yeah, 21, whatever. I'm trying to confuse me. Um, that Merlot is stunning. Thank you. Yeah, wine, that's solid. And yeah. that's that's what kind of, um, and, and I told uh, the story to you and Megan, but um, Rutherford Hill has a special spot in my heart. Um, it was the first winery I, I went to that morning. Uh, I proposed to my wife. And uh, I do remember the wines. I remember being as nervous as shit because I was going to propose to my wife. And we were having dinner um, that night at Leo Bears de Soleil. And we went to Rutherford Hill. And I think it was Con Creek. And I think it was either Franciscan or Markham. And I remember <clears throat> getting back to the room at like four o'clock and just being like absolutely schnockered, but hammered. And uh, I would like to thank Rutherford Hill for making me call my wife neat and putting it on the wrong finger in the wrong hand. But she did say yes, and we've been happily married for 17, almost 18 years. Um, 18 years in February. Uh, it is February, so 18 years at the end of this month. Nice. Well and um, so, yeah, I've always had a fond place for Rutherford Hill. And uh, I remember buying, a, it was, I think, the special reserve Merlot that day. And I remember drinking it like 15 years later, and it was just, it was awesome, you know. And I, and I love Merlot. I think Merlot is... Um, is uh, not really, um, it's kind of like forgotten and it's not really, people don't understand it. They don't think, they think like Merlot can't age, but if you, you were in Mar in in, uh, in Bordeaux, I mean Chateau Poutrous is Merlot as are many other right, right bank wines. Um, so that's, that's really spectacular. Thank you. Yo, it sounds, what I'm hearing is that you really would like to take a, um, a 2003 Reserve Merlot home just to butter up the wife because the anniversary is coming up soon? Probably not because she's not too happy with me. But yeah, that might help. I think it was 2003. <laughs> no, well, let's see. We came in, oh, we got engaged in 03. So yeah, no, it, would have been, it wouldn't have been an 03. I think it would have been an 01 then. Yeah, 01. Did those even do, 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 does that would that even drink well right now the 2000 Yeah, I was actually surprised. Uh, I've had some old wines um, just recently I've had the fortuity to be able to open some mm -hmm. and uh, I mean the 04 is drinking so beautifully right now. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah, I've I had a 78 and an 85. Uh, I was really astounded as to what old school Napa had to offer in terms of Merlot. I mean just wow. Right. And the funny thing with NAP is, and I had this conversation, I've had some really great conversations. I think a lot of the great conversations are at, off the air. Um, <clears throat> but the biggest knock on NAP, I think, right now is the wines don't age. And I don't know if it's certain styles at certain wineries that will go nameless. Um, you know, they want you to drink it quickly. But, I mean, I've had some wines from Napa, even like 10, 15, 20 years old, that are like, man, they could take another nap. Like Dunn. I just opened a Dunn recently. It was a 2005. And nice. um, it still had more time on it. It's kind of yeah. nice. Yeah. So big up to Mike Dunn. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, the biggest question I need to ask you is why why do why do Australians have egg on their damn hamburger? Because uh, it's delicious. Yeah. Nothing better than a fresh egg. Run it, adding some extra sauce over the top I think it's disgusting, yeah. yeah. I would rather have ketchup. Yeah. Actually, my son, my, uh, my my guy Sammy, had his first one. He loved it. An egg on a hamburger. I don't know where he had it, but he like loved it. Yeah. It's so funny. It's Avocado, it, egg, yeah. onions. Oh, delicious. Yeah. Does anybody do that in the valley for you? Um, just at home. Um, yeah. It's kind of funny that you say that because the immediate thought was, well, uh, egg on steak is also really good too. And that would probably be even more cringeworthy for you. But it's got to be sunny side up. You've got to get the you got to get the yolk oozing over the top. It's got to be fresh eggs. It's got to be great. Okay. So you're Australian, born and raised. No, you're not. No, I'm a fake. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in South Africa, but I moved to Australia when I was 15. So oh, I can so flip South the Africa. accent. Yeah, so okay, next yeah. time we have uh, yeah yeah, yeah we'll have you next Africans yes on, yeah. yes yeah another one. <laughs> really? Okay. We got a few more glasses. Maybe it'll come out. Yeah. No, I'll get it out. I mean, I'll get my out and about from Canada. So. Is there ever a goal to go back 
to South Africa or Australia and work in the wine industry there? Or is it something like, you know what, I can see myself in Napa. For, I mean, no one knows the future. No, no man or no woman knows the future. But can you see yourself being here long term? Do you see yourself, you know, you're passionate about, let's say, Bordeaux and you want to head back there? I mean, I guess, what is your goals? Yeah, my goals, uh, I definitely wouldn't, unfortunately, go back to South Africa or Australia. Well, right, okay. And, and the whole reason is that is America's done a lot for us and it's home for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I say us, my wife and I, and two beautiful labs. Um, but I definitely think Napa's where we want to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think what Napa does is really exciting. They uh, invest a lot in wine, and I'm all about great wine. I mm-hmm. think there's some exciting things happening in Oregon, but I'm a Cab fan, and I have been from the beginning, and as, mm-hmm. that's taboo in Australia. You've got to be a Syrah fan or a Shiraz fan. Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, Cab is king in, in my books, and my cellar's pretty full of that. Having said that, I've got a really great friend, um, and I worked at Jabalay, and uh, he always seduces me with some delicious Rhone wine, so yeah. it's not fair that I say that, Mike. Uh, wine fridge is full of cab because there's a lot of really great Rhone and Chateau Neufs in there. Oh, I'm so sure. Yeah. I'm just a sucker for great wine. Wherever there's yeah. passion and you work with great people and you get great fruit, I'm probably going to be there. Yeah, and I think that's the the hard part. Like yourself, you've got all this wine, and it's like you know, oh, you know, I, you could say you love cab, but then I've got a you know a, a single vineyard uh, San Giovese from uh, uh, Via uh, Villa Conchinaya with the Count. We had him on the the, the podcast La Fournice. And it's like, all right, I need to get some of that. I'm yeah. like, I don't have space, but I need some some of that. So, oh, yeah. and and that's the thing. What what is your kind of now that you've been all over the place, uh, Canada, France, um, and obviously in in Napa? What is your kind of um, opinion of Australian wines? I was surprised. Um, my palate has definitely changed. So when I first got here, I couldn't see eucalyptus uh, at all. You know, I, when I started at Inglenook, and we had a uh, blue gum uh, in the Syrah vineyard, and Everybody on the team's like, you can't smell the eucalyptus. Like, you guys are making it up. Like, I do not smell it for anything. Mm-hmm. Now it's really interesting and in seeing how your palate evolves and not trying the wines on a regular basis. It's very interesting to see Australian wines, although sadly they haven't, um, <coughs> they've seemed to have lost a little bit of momentum here in the US and they seem mm-hmm. to have fallen off the radar a little bit, which is great from a consumer perspective in terms of my mind because I mm-hmm. find a few gems and I like to share them. Um, but I, I really think one of the unsung heroes is what they're doing with Chardonnay. You know, they're really taking it more to an elegant, refined style. Um, and I think there's some really exciting stuff coming out there. They're obviously trying to not be as big and bold as some Chardonnays can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's some really great wines. So, I mean, there's always diamonds out there, right? And you can always see the good. And I, I think that's the joy of shopping wine, right? Yeah, absolutely. What is the fourth wine we had? That was pretty good. So that's the AJT Cab. It's 2021 okay. as well. So um, one of the things we're doing is putting a new focus onto the Merlot and the Cab in terms of trying to keep them as varietally correct as we can. Okay. Um, so obviously in California, you can um, um, blend down to about 75%, but we want to bring that back up to closer to 95. And the okay. AJT Cab is single vari- uh, single vineyard. And so we actually don't have many different varieties out there, but we have many different clones of Cabernet, which is exciting. So to work with different clones on the same site uh, and see different expressions is really exciting. So and this uh, is in honor of the founder of Terlato, right? Yeah, Anthony John yeah. Terlato. Yeah. So AJT, um, everybody know, knew him as Tony in the industry. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's very nice. That's very, very nice. How is 2021 as a vintage? I think 21 was a, a pretty... Especially after 2020. <laughs> I, well, after that, it's exceptional. Yeah. Uh, I think 2021 was a really good year all around. Uh, I think it was a really great year. I mean, there was a lot of, few heat spikes in there, um, but I think all in all, the vines fared fairly well. Um, 2020, sadly, you know, if you look at all the vines and everything you saw out there, it was going to be one of the best vintages around, um, sadly. But, you, but know. You, you know what? I've tasted some 2020s this week. Yeah damn good yeah they've got the color concentration yeah but not everybody made it obviously but the 2020s i have had it's like i was up at pride tried three 2020s merlot cab and cab franc excellent tried a 2020 uh hourglass uh their blue line merlot which is which is i don't know if you've ever had it it's delicious um in 20 i mean it was drinking beautifully lovely so uh and then kirk venge had some venge wines from 2020 and those were good too so um, it'll be interesting to see 
because uh, 2021 is is good is is looking as or ha- is good in 2022 it was was pretty darn good too right yeah 22 was great i mean it has to be one of the best vintages for white i've seen um and that's a survey size of seven years and the reason i say that we had a really cool spring yes we had some frost but generally we had the pretty much the ideal ripening season and that's why i'm elated with the sauvignon blanc i think it's very expressive but then that late spike i think the good growers and the the people who are fortunate enough to have overhead or mm-hmm. um sprinklers that help cool the vineyard down would fare very well and we were lucky we do have that um opportunity to um to put water on the vineyard and overhead to cool it down um but really good growers i think saw that coming got lots of water in the ground and fared really well so it's it'll be really interesting i think there'll be a mixed like 21 uh, like 2020 there'll be a mixed bag so anybody who didn't think it was up to snuff got rid of their wine which is fair enough and then the ones who did didn't great job and i think 22 will be exactly the same i think there'll be some people that just rocked it and others that um you know learned some some new things okay so yeah and that's that's very true so we're doing barrel samples or tank samples barrel samples how much different the wine we're tasting right now, how much different when it's all finished and what have you in bottle, how much different is it going to be than what we're tasting now? I think what we have here is pretty representative. Obviously, the Sub Blanc is going to be brighter. It's um, it's obviously cloudy right now. Once we uh, do all the fining on that or cold stabilizing, it'll come bright and crisp. Um, the rosé is at the 90-yard line. It's just got a little bit more um, sediment to drop out. And how we do that is we just chill it right down to 26 degrees and just wait, essentially. Um, do the thing that most winemakers uh, um, struggle with is just waiting and watching. Um, but when it comes to the Merlot, Cab, and the Heaven's Peak, I, I think what you're seeing now, we're, what, um, five months away from bottling. You should just see, I, I think you're starting to see the integration of the oak there. It's a little coarse on the back, mm-hmm. on the back end. But the wines are pretty bright, and um, I think what you'll just see when we run it down the line, we'll brighten it up, and we'll we'll make sure that there's uh, there's no cloudiness or anything in there. And just I think the fruit will pop, and the oak will be beautifully integrated. We really did a lot of work, you know. I leveraged a lot of my skills from Inniskillen, I mean, from Inglenook and um, Margot in terms of finding and respecting the fruit and using some really great agents that they would traditionally use there. And I think they're going to pay dividends down the line. So I'm excited nice. with that. Nice, nice. So we do this little section uh, called Sip and Spit. It's brought to you by Silvador Brands, the official Aragon gas uh, preserver of the Cork and Taylor Wine podcast. So I'm going to ask you like six or seven questions. They're supposed to be short and sweet, but they never are. But there's some interesting answers. You might uh, never talk to me again, but that's okay. Uh, most memorable wine experience? Um, unfortunately... And like you have said with your wife, there was a divorce moment out there when it came to engagement. Nice. I recently got married uh, at the time. Congratulations. Yeah. So this was in 2014 and I, um, my wife and I did the really cheap kind of wedding and we just did family and made a lot of enemies or realized that uh, we made our funny? friends wonder why we got married without them. And essentially I took her on a five week around the world trip. And so we did Bordeaux. Uh, we did obviously Napa, um, we did Inniskill and we went to Niagara on the Lake. And then I went to see um, my buddy in the Rhone that, um, his name's Ralph Grassin, okay. or Garcin, and he uh, is now the winemaker of Chateau Nailas, um, but he was the winemaker of Jabalais. And fortunately I took my wife there on his birthday and his buddy from NJ Gallo, who's one of the sales um, directors out there, mm-hmm. flew out as a surprise for his birthday. And um, uh, if anybody knows Ralph uh, or was really good friends with him, he's of the mind where let's open 14 wines and let's watch them for the next two or three days. So there was six of us. There was two couples or three couples. I'm sorry because my math is appalling right That's now. Right. But yeah, so there were three couples there. Um, and uh, Ralph is a kind of uh, winemaker that's just like me. If you're going to do it, let's do it right. Yeah. So we started out with um, a couple of Grand Cru Colt Burgundies. Um, you know, what, what else would you cleanse your palate with and just right. get going in the evening? Right. And when I Googled some of these wines, because I, I hadn't I'd hardly seen them or ever seen them, I was like, oh, my God, we started out with like $600 wine. <laughs> uh, and obviously he worked at Jabalais, Um So we had all the uh, Gougal La London or... Uh, Lala's, as we call them. So we had all those, and then uh, those were incredible. Uh, we had 1991 La Chapelle, 
And like we were talking up at Echelon of like the Rhone. I was like, mm-hmm. wow, this is fantastic. So he whips out and to, as a precursor to this, I was very lucky in that um, when I worked harvest with him earlier in the year, just before we got married, ironically, naturally, when everybody's losing their mind about getting married, um, uh, Jeb Donnock was coming and they opened mm-hmm. 25 years of La Chapelle. <laughs> And so we did this blind tasting and or I got to see all the wines there and he's like, I've never had the opportunity to taste La Chapelle in 25 years in a row. Yeah. Incredible tasting and wow, like just mind blowing. So, um, you know, we did that and he whips out this blind wine and I'm like, look, I, you know, this is, why, this is a guy who has the wines of the world and does this beautiful trading and he whips out a... Uh, in a blind wine, I got it right, uh, which I was very fortunate before because I had the memory. We had the 1990 La Chapelle, and he got a little annoyed. So then he whips out another blind wine, and um, uh, I said, look, well, this is really difficult. I think it's Cabernet. I think it's Bordeaux. And I was fortunate. Obviously, at Margot, we got to try a lot of great wine as well. And I, was, I said, look, I'm really a little stumped on this one. It's either a 97 or a 94, and I'm going to say Margot. I think this is a Chateau Margot. And he's like, you've got to give final answer. And he was, he was like stone cold. He's like, he's getting annoyed and like, okay. So I say, all right, I'm going to put a stake in the ground. I go 97. He's like, wrong, 94. I'm like, oh, damn it. So anyway, he was still a little annoyed that I got pretty close. And he's like, all right, smart ass. Let's see what you got here. So um, he whips out this one wine and my wife's sitting next to me. I was like, all right, so we've tasted the upper echelons of wine. This could be yellowtail right now. Like we've had a lot of wine yeah. and I can tell you whatever's in this glass is unbelievable and you should drink a lot of it and it was her birth year petrus i didn't even come close i got a 2000 petrus and i'm like you know what sucks is that this is the most amazing wine and you can never do better than this and i will never give you better wine than this birth year wine from margo uh from petrus i mean it was awesome so long answer to your question that was probably the most memorable and amazing segue into a this is the best the rhone has and then this mm-hmm. is the best bordeaux has like uh, and those are kind of my two yeah, your regions. Loves, yeah. Yeah. Is, wow. your, is your wife in the wine industry? Um, she was for a small time. She worked with uh, Mike Wayne Bigler, who was on here before. Yeah, Baltac. Uh, yeah, so she him, yeah. did a Just... short stint there, and then she worked at Via Dare up the hill. Okay. And then she worked at um, Fontanella, but now she made her way to the healthcare industry, which is where she started, and she was at Kaiser Permanente. Okay. Okay, yeah. cool. Cool, cool. Favorite vintage, least favorite vintage? Great question. Second time in this interview. Yeah, I know. This yeah, is, this is I know. Exciting. Um, I think 2015 at uh, Inglenook was pretty great. Uh, we had pretty much the ideal ripening uh, year. Um, I learned that the California sun is way more um, gentle on the skin than Australia. Mm-hmm. I remember going out there and forgetting sun cream and not getting sunburnt, which is <laughs> unreal for Australia yeah. because yeah. They had the hole in the ozone, which I hear is healing, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was fantastic. And then the other, probably the worst one was 2011 in Australia, which seemed to be around the world. And a lot of people struggle with 11. Mm-hmm. A very wet vintage, but uh, where there's bad, there's good. I learned a lot about, that was when I was at Wolf Blast, and I learned a lot mm-hmm. about how to course correct for pretty much um, the least ideal situations for wine, which okay. is you can't get into vineyards, you've got mud turning up in your tank. You know, you had everything, you had all sorts of things going on in 2011. So yeah. I would say that's probably my worst. And like yeah. 15 2011 in Napa. Na- Napa was rated real bad, and I actually loved all the wines I had from there. So figure that one out. Um, if they named a wine after you, what would be called? What would it be called, and what would be in it? What would be the blend? Oh, great, great. Um, see, I didn't say question, so it doesn't yeah. count as well, number three. A two and a half. Yeah. Um, I would probably um, be a little rogue on this one, and I would probably say um, uh, I'd probably be partial to a GSM, but then where we are and where it's from, I'd probably be partial to a Bordeaux blend. Um, I just had the uh, Pichon Longueville uh, Comtesse Le Lande on the weekend. Good chip. Oh, man, that 2020, in terms of my mind, I think Pomerol had a great year, 2020, but that Pichon... Bordeaux, off. I just did the... Uh, uh, I saw Michael Wayne Beckler quickly. He was busy uh, for the 2020 uh, Union Grand Cru Bordeaux. I didn't know you were there. I was yeah. there too. Yeah, that's... Uh, oh, were you really? Yeah. In New York? No, I was here in San okay. Francisco. Yeah, I was in New York. And um, 
It was, uh, man, I actually have a podcast coming out with uh, with my most memorable. I don't do top tens because I don't want to piss anybody off. Most memorable. And, I mean, there was, uh, holy shit. I mean, like Brand Cantona, Cantona Brown. Um, uh, what's the one? Um, Pavi McQueen. I mean, it was Chateau Canon. I mean, it, 2020 Vintage is, is legit. Yep. Is freaking legit. Yeah, and that, that tasting was awesome to see what, the, um, you know, the power and the finesse and then also How just, packed was it? Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm a geek, so I went to both tastings and both were pretty you did rammed. the trade in the public? Yeah, hell yeah. You so could, you got, to get you got 80 in for, wines in two You got in for free and you, you get paid for the other one. Do you get in for free for the second one? No, I paid for it. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I only went in. I went to the trade and it's like I want to do some like kind of like social media stuff, ask some questions, like just off the cuff, like who would win between left bank and right bank in a fist fight. And I couldn't because, I mean, it was literally three people deep. I mean, it was a shit show. Yeah. It was a great shit show. Yeah. But I only tried to think about... Um, Maybe 25 to 30 wines. So I, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, that's not... So how many wines did you try? I tried all of them. How many were there? 80? Yeah. So they had 100 and... 100. But there was some that, like, for instance, I wanted to try uh, Malscott, Chateau Malscott. They, mm-hmm. they weren't pouring. Yeah, there were a couple there that weren't at um, San Francisco. Yeah. But, I mean, still to do Who 80 cares? wines yeah, in two whatever. hours is crazy. Yeah. To yeah. give respect to that is... What were some of your favorites? Um, Other than the Comtesse. I was actually really impressed with um, the Comtesse Lalonde. I thought um, Contenac Brown, like you said, was great. There was um, uh, a Saturn off the top of my head that I forget that was uh, amazing. And uh, out of the group of six of us, everybody kind of deviated, but then came back like the one Saturn. Mm -hmm. God, I'm I'm blanking right now. I didn't try any Saturn. Oh, didn't you? I've never even tried Saturn in my life. Isn't that pathetic? Yeah, well, especially... I know, uh, I know. next time I go... I'll if you get it. to dive in, you'll see what some great Sauvignon yeah. Blanc on the sweet end yeah. looks like and some Semillon. My uh, goal is to go to Bordeaux next year and podcast. That's my goal. Sweet. Yeah. That's a so good we'll goal. See. Yeah. 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 And there was some great Sauvignon Blancs. I thought Carboneau did a great job. Yeah, um, they always do. But yeah, I think... Did you try the... White? What did you think of the uh, Smith Hot Lafitte White? I think they did a great job. Yeah. Um, the red got 100 points. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they did a good job. I yeah. I think there it would be nice if um, they were decanting some of them. Yeah. Just to, I would hope that more people would rave about it because yeah. I I think when they just pull the cork and pour it, I think um, you know people just assume that it might have been decanted. But yeah. There were some really stellar wines there. Like I tried the Lynch Bosch, and I've always loved Lynch Bosch. Didn't like it. Wow. It was too tight, and I think if you decant it. It would, but Lynch Bodge is one of those ones that's kind of built to age and kind of built to open in ten years. You shouldn't be drinking it right away. Right. But um, yeah, it was it was pretty good. Did you notice how some of the French the the French purveyors and people were like just kind of like bored and were like ready to be done? I felt yeah. bad for them. I mean, it's got to be tiring as hell. Well, yeah, the, they had done five cities before us in such yep. a short time, and um, uh, yeah. I, the having said that, the lady at Rosen Seglar, she was amazing and had, had lots of energy, and yeah. I was a sucker for Rosen Seglar because um, yeah, they were just that. down the road from Margo, and I like look, I've been back five times, but your wine is fantastic. Yeah. Did you did you know anybody from the from the tasting? No, sadly, uh, I didn't recognize anybody there. Um, there was um, uh, Theon Paul was there, um, but it wasn't Fiona. Um, I know Fiona. I recognize a few of the surnames, but I didn't know the people no. themselves. Yeah, a lot of them were the, the were the were the owners, right? Or no? Why and there were a own? couple of proprietors there. Yeah, okay. yeah, but yeah. I didn't know the them. count. Yeah, yeah. but um, Pichon Baron was um, uh, sorry, Leoville Barton, um, one of the. The lady, the, um, uh, uh, no, the gentleman who's probably the heir to the throne. Uh, he was there. He's got a very English accent, but he's uh, he's French. Um, yeah, he was pouring is, it out, yeah. tasting, and yeah, I've seen him around the circuit a few times. Yeah, cool, cool. Uh, favorite part of your job? Ah, getting to talk to people. Um, I think there's nothing better than people sharing wine and mm-hmm. talking wine. They could come in with uh, barefoot Moscato. But just to see people's most intimate... Barefoot Moscato. You know, yeah, for me, it's the most important thing is somebody coming in and saying, you know what, I love this one <clears> for that. You see a very intimate side of people. Mm-hmm. You know, when you see politics, you see people get really nasty and you see a different side. But yeah, for me, wine is just... Yep. You see the inner core of somebody and you see a memory come back. Like you asked me about the 89 um, Petrus and what mm-hmm. made my wife almost divorce me. I was like, well, you can't do better. So, or I can't do better. So we might as well end it here type <laughs> thing. But you see people just go back to childhood memory and you see the mm-hmm. inner side of them and the sparkle. To me, that's yep. the beauty about wine. Yep. Biggest misconception about Australian wines. 
uh, that they're cheap and nasty. Yellowtail. Yep. Okay. Yeah. In your opinion, Shiraz or Syrah? Um, depends where it's from. I think Australia's done a really good job, like Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. It'd be good if they, if other people come up with another name. Um, so for me, Shiraz comes from Australia and Syrah comes from the Rhone. Yep. I think there's two different styles of wine. Look, I, I don't dispute there's some cult wines that do a really good mm -hmm. take on the Rhone, like uh, Clona Killer, I think, crush it and do a really good job. Like there are Napa wines, Napa cabs that take on Bordeaux. So mm -hmm. um, depends on the company, I guess, is the answer. Okay. Okay. Nice politi political answer right yeah. there. Well, Sit on the fence. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, I would pick Syrah over Shiraz, but that's okay. Uh, favorite varietal or, and least favorite varietal? Oh. Mm, piece wow. of cheese. Yeah. Um, favorite varietal and least favorite varietal? Hmm. I think um, every variety has its opportunity and every variety has its... Um, moment i guess uh i think unfortunately syrah is um w probably one of my least uh the reason i say that is because australia was really good with syrah or shiraz at the time and we put it everywhere you shouldn't have and we put it everywhere you should have too so you saw the best and the worst and no matter what winery you we went to we're going to do shiraz uh so for me um shiraz has to be up there but that's uh, a very biased view i do enjoy really good shiraz from around the world um so that's just a personal bias. Um, but then the favorite variety, I think the most forgiving variety is probably Cabernet. I enjoy um, sneak peeks into what Petit Verdot does and Um I don't know. Everything has its great, uh, has its has its opportunity in mind. Yeah, mind. yeah. If, if, if someone said, what do you best associate, if you were a, a grape varietal, what grape varietal would you be? Hmm. Great question. I know that's four and a half. I didn't say it though. You were so thinking. I, I'm proud of myself. I really, you could yeah. read it on my face. I yeah. don't dispute yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and what great variety would I be? I'd probably be an unsung hero. I'd be like Grenache, you know? People mm -hmm. go, oh, oh, actually, you know, uh, if you did Nebbiolo, I think that's a good one. It's like people were like, I love um, uh, Barolo, uh, and they will dive into it and they'll tell you all this. Um, and then you're like, well, what about Nebbiolo or Sangiovese or any of these? And like, oh, no, I don't like that. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. You know, <coughs> so. What would your wife say you are? Uh, she'd probably say uh, I'm Chardonnay. Um, the reason I can say that because um, <laughs> you can be light, medium or heavy. So yeah. some days I, I come in and I like to be a little heavy handed around the house in terms of getting some stuff done. And she's like, you know what? Um, you know, maybe you should have a little bit more attention to detail, but, you know, yeah. I can go both ways, all okay. three ways. Okay. Well, I appreciate you. you're going to stick with us, Michael, and we're going to, uh, we're going to talk. I've got one question for you. Uh, thanks for having me. This yeah, has absolutely. been a real treat and I'm a real pleasure. I'm glad we could um, rekindle some old memories. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Some Canadian, some egg, some divorce stories, amongst other things. But, so we uh, should probably not talk Leafs then. Uh, I'd rather not. It's it's a source up subject. We haven't won a Stanley Cup since what the '60s, I think. But I'm surprised you can remember that far back. Well, I wasn't born, but that was before I was born. But uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, Michael. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining me, Michael. But thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Just forget. To, uh, just don't forget to uh, follow us on uh, Instagram, Facebook. Um, subscribe so it's always there for you. A new episode every Thursday, and um, follow us on the YouTube channel and also up at Silver Door Brands. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. As always, keep drinking the good stuff.